so this morning we're talking about the mind-body connection and thank you for all the minds and bodies that helped me get this going. Um, Dana already introduced us. Uh, this is my family um, and as she said I'm married to a rheumatologist with three children. We went my husband and I met at Loma Linda University in medical school. I'm so glad I met him there. And I'm board certified in dermatopathology. So does anyone know what that is? Okay, so have you heard of a pathologist? Yes. Okay, someone who looks at specimens under the microscope or runs the lab. But I specialized in skin pathology. So if a dermatologist sees you and takes a shave or a punch biopsy, I'd be the one that would look at it and interpret it. And my brother right here runs my lab for me, so I really appreciate that. <laughs> and um, just a disclosure, I'm, I'm not getting any compensation for this talk. So I wanted to thank the Huntsville Seventh-day Adventist Church because they're the ones that paid for the expenses for us to have this program. So if you're a member, would you raise your hand and then the people next to you can thank you for making this possible because we really appreciate it. We couldn't have done it without your support. So this is the flyer that a lot of you saw and it said, is there a way to eat and live for optimal brain health? So that's what I'm going to try to cover for you today. And also I was asked to speak to nature and how nature um, helps our brains our moods, mental health. So we're going to start with the definition of health, okay? In 1946, the World Health Organization defined health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So in other words, you can be in excellent physical shape, but if you don't have mental health, you're not really healthy. So how are we doing in America as far as mental health? Um, these statistics I'm about to show you was taken from the National Alliance on Mental Illness and it's um, from 2017. So did you know that 2.4 million Americans live with schizophrenia? 6.1 million American adults live with bipolar disorder. 16 million Americans live with depression, major depression. And 42 million Americans live with anxiety disorder. So we need a lot of help, right? So there are a lot of consequences to mental illnesses. And um, one of them is that 10.2 million adults have co-occurring mental health and addiction disorders. So they kind of run together. When you have a mental health problem, you tend to look for ways to fix it. And it's not always a healthy way. 26% of homeless adults staying in shelters have serious mental illnesses and approximately 24% of state prisoners have a recent history of a mental health condition. So what is the impact of these mental illnesses? Well, I didn't know this till I did this study, but um, depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide and is the major contributor to the global burden of disease. You know, I wouldn't have really put depression there. I might have put heart disease or something, but it's depression. And serious mental Ill illness costs America $193 billion every year. And 90% of those who die by suicide have an underlying mental illness. And suicide is the tenth leading cause of death in the United States right now. So the statistics we just read are pretty grim. Uh, but there are things we can do to help ourselves and help others who have mental illnesses or who just want better mental health. So in this lecture, we're going to look at two main areas in which we can make changes to have optimal brain health. The first is the gut-brain connection, and we're going to look at diet, how your diet can affect your intelligence level and also your mental health. And then I'm going to introduce something to you that's fairly new in the last decade uh, for medical practitioners, and that's the gut microbiome, how what we host affects our mood. So I thought that was kind of wild. <laughs> then I was also asked to speak to nature and um, it's surprising all the benefits to nature. We'll look at how it can improve our memory. It can decrease inflammation and of course improve some mental disorders. So we're going to go through several studies and we'll start with the gut-brain connection. Now the very first scientific study ever recorded, the first written one, was in 562 BC in a very old book and it happened to be found in Daniel chapter 1 and it's the story of 
when King Nebuchadnezzar uh, attacked Jerusalem, um, he got into the city and he took a bunch of the Hebrews captive. And one of those captives was Daniel. And he took Daniel and several friends back to Babylon where they were put into the schools there. They were going to be trained in the language and to be able to help with the government there. And they were treating them very nicely and they said, you get to eat at the king's table. But Daniel had a problem with that. He wasn't used to eating the rich foods at the king's table. And he, so in Daniel uh, chapter 1 verse 8, he said, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. <clears throat> so Daniel proposed a test to the person in charge of him. And he said, you know, I'm, I don't usually eat this, and I think I'll be healthier if I don't, so please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. The actual word was pulse, and pulse, by definition, is foods from seeds. So that would be your fruits and vegetables and stuff. Then he said, then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies and then do with us as you'd like. So what, what came out of this? So in Daniel chapter 1 verses 15 and 16, we read that at the end of just 10 days of a vegetable diet compared to the friends who ate the king's food, that the features of the young men appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portions of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink, and he gave them vegetables. But the story continues. These uh, four young men that happened to do it uh, did three more years of schooling and at the end of the three years the king tested everybody to see what they had learned and when the king interviewed Daniel and his three friends in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them he found them ten times better than all the magicians and the astrologers who were in his realm so what do we learn from the very first study that was ever recorded, well, what Daniel ate and his friends enhanced his intellect. So it seems like if God had wanted us to, uh, God would want us to know what the best diet would be, right? Well, it turns out that in Genesis 129, he recorded for us his original diet for man. And that in Genesis 129, it says, God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. So this diet was originally given to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And does anyone know what the word Eden means in Hebrew? It means pleasure. So God knew that a diet from plants would give man the most pleasure. That was his original plan. How many of you have heard of the Blue Zones? Anyone? Awesome. Okay, for those of you who haven't heard, in 2005, the National Geographic magazine had a cover story called The Secrets of Long Life by Dan Wetner. And in this study, or this story, Dan studied the five geographic areas where people statistically live the longest. And I don't know if you can read it very well, but it's Okinawa, Japan, Icaria, Greece, Sardinia, Italy, Nicoya, Costa Rica, and one place in the United States. It's Loma Linda, California. So. <laughs> so in studying the people who live the longest, one of the nine lessons, take home lessons that he got out of studying them, was that um, the people who live the longest had a mostly plant-based diet. Now, as you may have heard briefly, um, my husband and I went to medical school here. This is Loma Linda, California, one of the places where people live the longest. And their motto there was to make man whole. And they <clears throat> also had a vision to transform lives through education, health care, and research. So as part of their mission, they do a lot of health studies. And they tried to get some of their studies out there in this little production here called Live It. And I'm going to try to show a sample video for you real quick.
ever crave a juicy steak or tender serving of filet mignon? Well, you may be better off creating something other than red meat. A team of researchers at Loma Linda University Health have been investigating lifestyle and health for nearly 60 years in what's known as the Adventist Health Studies. What they've found is those who eat a vegetarian diet have a lower risk for chronic diseases, which ultimately translates into longer, healthier living. In our study, the vegetarians compared to the non-vegetarians do have a lower risk of chronic disease, a lower risk of high blood pressure, a lower risk of high cholesterol, a lower risk of diabetes that are less obese, and a lower risk of dying from heart disease, ultimately. The researchers recently discovered that vegetarians are 22% less likely to develop colorectal cancers, the second leading cause of cancer death in the United States. So how can you start eating a vegetarian diet and experience the lifestyle benefits? If giving up meat entirely is too much, why not reconsider how often you eat meat? For example, try eating only fish or eat other meats only once a week to experience similar health benefits associated with the vegetarian lifestyle. The second tip is to eat fewer refined foods like sugar, desserts, snack foods, and fast food meals. Instead, we should eat more whole grains and natural foods like fruits, vegetables, legumes, and nuts. The closer you get to some kind of natural state, growing your own garden, shopping at a local farmer's market, that can be very helpful. If you commit to following these tips, you can enjoy the benefits of lowering your risk for chronic disease and living six to nine years longer. There's your tip for the day on how you can live healthier, longer. If you like that video at all, um, there are more on YouTube. Just Google Live It, and they have quite a few different topics. So just for interest's sake, I wanted to look back on the history of the great vegetarians. Um, this is a picture of some. We have Albert Einstein, Gandhi, Leo Tolstoy, Voltaire, Plato, Tesla, Leonardo da Vinci. And then Einstein had this quote, nothing will benefit human health and, the increase, and increase the chances for survival of life on Earth as much as the evolution to a vegetarian diet. <clears throat> There's some famous vegetarians that are living currently. We have Bill Clinton, Ellen DeGeneres, Mike Tyson. There may be some other people you recognize there. There's also in the upper right-hand corner this award-winning um, person who holds the heavyweight log lifting record. He lifted 100, a 190 kilogram, which is 418 pound uh, log. So, and he's vegan. So. So while I won't be talking about this in particular, I'd like to mention it on this one slide. It is a myth that you don't get enough protein with a plant-based plant -based diet. So the average recommended daily intake of protein is 42 grams a day. Non-vegetarians get about 80 grams a day. But vegetarians and vegans actually average 70% more protein than they need every day. So just in case you wondered, if you want to know exactly what amount of protein you should be eating, it's uh, you multiply your weight in pounds by 0.36. Okay, I also wanted to run over some quick uh, definitions because sometimes there's confusion about what's a vegetarian, what's a vegan, what's plant-based. So a vegetarian is a person who does not eat any meat, but they may eat other animal products. For instance, a lacto-ovo vegetarian eats dairy and eggs, whereas a lacto-vegetarian eats dairy but not eggs and an ovo vegetarian eats eggs but not dairy. So then what's a vegan? A vegan does not eat dairy products, eggs, meat, or any other animal product. So if it had a mama or if it came from an animal they don't eat it. The only problem with being vegan is there's a lot of foods that aren't good for you that are vegan. Did you know Oreos are vegan? So, <laughs> okay, so what we're talking about here is a plant-based diet, a diet based on foods derived from plants that includes whole grains, nuts, seeds, legumes, fruit, and the motto to remember is whole foods eaten whole, or as close to whole as you can. And if you were on a plant-based diet, uh, these would be the foods that you're eating. This is the plant-based diet pyramid. So back to mental health and intelligence. Will a plant-based diet improve my intelligence?
So our first study from the book of Daniel and the Bible looked at dietary intake and academic achievement and we saw that what Daniel ate improved his intellect. Have studies been repeated that would prove that today? So these are a few studies I'm going to list here that looked at dietary intake and academic achievement in college students. This the first study was a systematic review of all the articles ever published on the topic in English through January of 2016 regarding students in higher education. And the results suggested that a healthier diet, which in their definition was increased fruits and veggies and eating breakfast, may be associated with higher academic achievement. In another cross-sectional survey of 17,789 students from 27 universities in 26 countries, they found that those consuming two or more servings of fruits attained higher academic achievement. In another study, university students that regularly consumed french fries, soda, or meals at university restaurants were less likely to even attend exams. So we probably know how they did. <laughs> Um, here's an example of a school that implemented an all-vegetarian menu, which included breakfast and lunch under the influence of the people that did forks over knives. And here is what they found when they implemented this at their school. The students had a lower body mass index, they were sick less often, and their standardized test scores were number 11 in the state. And for them, I guess they thought this was a really good achievement, and being number 11 in New York probably is. So. Um, so in another study, the National Child Development Study, they looked at vegetarians and IQ. So participants included 8,170 men and women who were 30. And these men and women had undergone intelligence testing um, between the ages of 3 and 16, but now they're 30. And what they found is that the vegetarians have a mean childhood IQ of 109, whereas meat eaters had a, a mean childhood IQ of 100. And the difference was very large and significant. So they concluded that higher IQ scores in childhood are associated with an increased likelihood of vegetarianism in adults. And we'll look at why that might be on the next slide. But for any of you who are vegetarians, you know we get asked a lot, why are you a vegetarian? And now you can tell them, because I have a high IQ. <laughs> okay, so this um, next study looks at why maybe IQ is associated with being vegetarian. And it's called the Savannah IQ Interaction Hypothesis. And um, this man, an evolutionary psychologist, suggested that the ability to change your personal habits in response to challenges in the world is strongest in people with higher empathy and intelligence. Intelligent people cope more easily with situations that did not exist in the past. And so intelligent people are more likely to make wiser choices about what they eat as they consider both their own health and animal welfare issues. So we've seen a few studies that would support that a plant-based diet will help your intelligence, but what about my mood or my mental health? This scientific study was published in 2010 in the Nutrition Journal looking specifically at plant-based diets and mental health. Scientists used two psychology tests to evaluate mood and the subjects um, and what they found is that the subjects eating plant-based diets appear to experience fewer negative emotion and more vigor than people who ate meat. And then they wanted to know, well, why is that? First of all, they thought that the people eating the better diets were, might have been happier because they were healthier. That would make sense. But the second point really interested me, and that is um, meat is full of a pro-inflammatory compound called arachidonic acid. And you know that um, inflammation can adversely affect your mental health. So what do you think are the top sources of food for arachidonic levels? Anyone want to guess? Fish? Okay, anyone else have a guess for the number one? Red meat? Okay. Chicken? Okay. The number one source is chicken. Number two is eggs. So even our vegetarians can't get away from it. Beef, pork, and fish were the top five sources of arachidonic acid and on the bottom you can see it omnivores consume nine times more arachidonic acid than those eating a plant-based diet and so it increases our inflammation which adversely affects our mental health 
The same scientist who did the last studies, which was cross-sectional, said, well, let's see what happens if we take people who are eating meat and take the meat away, what will that do for their mood? So they took men and women who ate meat more than once a day, they took away their meat and eggs, and then studied their mood. And in two weeks, the subjects experienced significant improvement in their mood sta states. In a letter entitled Depression and Fruit Treatment, several doctors note that fruit could be a depression, dementia, and suicide buster. Well, why would that be? Well, re research has shown that serotonin, melatonin, and tryptophan, those are names of neurotransmitters, they're associated with the disease Alzheimer's, they're associated with other forms of dementia, with depression, and with suicide. But did you know that there are foods that contain animal neurotransmitters? So it was found that uh, serotonin, melatonin, and tryptophan can be found in some of these can be found in plantains, pineapples, bananas, kiwis, plums, tomatoes, white and black mustard, wolfberry seeds, etc. So I thought that was pretty amazing that some of the neurotransmitters that make us happy, that make us feel better, are found in these foods. This was a neat study conducted in Australia, and they wanted to see whether you could improve your well being as you increased your fruit and vegetable consumption. So they took the food diaries of 12,000 Australians and they found that increased fruit and vegetable consumption was predictive of increased happiness, life satisfaction, and well-being. And what they found is that if you ate eight or more fruits or veggies per day, the change in your mood would be the same as if you were unemployed and needed a job and then suddenly you got a job. So that was a pretty big change in mood, just from increasing the fruits and veggies that you eat. This is a graph from that study, showing that as you increase your fruits and vegetables to eight or more, your life satisfaction goes up. So this is an easy way to feel happier, wouldn't you say? Okay, you guys know the saying, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, right? But eight or more apples a day keeps the psychiatrist away. <laughs> <laughs> in another study, we learn we can treat the blues with greens. So higher consumption of vegetables may decrease your risk of de developing depression by up to 62%. So our current understanding of depression is that there is an enzyme called monoamine oxidase that's overactive in our bodies. And so it eats up the neurotransmitters that we need to feel good. And so they developed drugs to block the monoamine oxidase, thinking that would help. But unfortunately, if you eat cheese with some of those drugs, you can have a fatal brain hemorrhage. <clears throat> Excuse me. But there's an alternate treatment, because plant foods naturally inhibit monoamine oxidase, including apples, berries, grapes, onions, as well as some spices, and including cloves, oregano, cinnamon, and nutmeg. So. That's a lot easier than having a brain hemorrhage. Um, so eating lots of fruits and veggies may present a non-invasive, natural, and inexpensive therapeutic means to support a healthy brain. Okay, I want to show you this quick clip. Uh, this is a clip by um, Dr. Mc Michael Greger. Um, he's from England. He wrote this book, How Not to Die. It's a subject-based book, depending on what disease you have, and he goes through all the studies that are out and um, tells you how not to die. So I hope you like this short little clip. It's pretty good. Improving mood through diet. We know vegetarian diets were, have been associated with healthier mood states, but you don't know if it's cause and effect until you put it to the test. And that's what was done this year. You take regular meat eaters and you remove meat, fish, poultry, and eggs in the study from their diets. And you can see a significant improvement in mood scores after just two weeks. It can take drugs like Prozac, you know, months to take effect. In fact, the way drugs like Prozac work is they boost the levels of the so-called happiness hormone serotonin. Did you know there is serotonin in plants? I had no idea. I certainly didn't. But there's serotonin and dopamine and all sorts of human neurotransmitters in plants. So much so, 
There's been a call to start treating depression with high content sources of serotonin. You know, like plantains, pineapples, bananas, kiwis, plums, and tomatoes. Right? And what's the down? I mean, what's what's the side effects? You got a little seed stuck in your teeth or something? Right? high intake of fruits, vegetables, mushrooms, and soy associated with decreased prevalence of depression. Maybe that's why improved behavior in teenagers was significantly associated with higher intakes of leafy green vegetables and fresh fruit. Uh, for more, uh, keep an eye out for my videos on the wrong way to boost serotonin, which is by these uh, tryptophan supplements. A better way uh, to raise serotonin to fight uh, things like premenstrual depression. Um, and, uh, and then the best way, um, as reported in this double-blind, placebo-controlled crossover study on the successful use of butternut squash seeds in the treatment of social anxiety disorder, for example. Right. Amazing. Thank you so much for watching this video. <laughs> All right. So now we're going to switch gears just a little bit and we're going to talk about the gut brain axis, okay? Or axis. So the gut brain axis refers to the way our gut communicates with our brain. It, it does it through biochemical signaling through our nervous system and it's come. So I'm going to start here. The enteric nervous system, so enteric is anything referring to your um, small intestines, large intestines. So the enteric nervous system is an extensive network of neurons lining our gut. In fact, there's so many of them. There's more nerves in this enteric nervous system than there is in your spinal column and peripheral nerves combined. So scientists have called it our second brain, which I would have never guessed. This is a picture of a cross-section of intestine and the yellow lines are an example of the nerves that are wrapping around our um, intestine. Okay, so the enteric nervous system is composed of 100 million neurons, more than the spinal cord or peripheral nervous system. It communicates with the brain through the vagus nerve, which is a lar large nerve that runs from the gut to the brain. It partly determines our mental state and plays a role in certain diseases in our body. Even though it's so large, it doesn't have any conscious thought or decision making like our central nervous system. It uses over 30 neurotransmitters just like our brain, which is one reason why um, when you're on an antidepressant medication that affects serotonin, for example, it can have serious GI side effects because the gut is also using a lot of serotonin. It, so this um, enteric nervous system performs more than digestion or inflict an occasional nervous pain. Now it's considered more of a metabolic organ than just a digestive one. So in this book here by Dr. Mayer, um, he's stated as saying, a big part of our emotions are probably influenced by the nerves in our gut. Butterflies in the stomach, for example, is just one example. Have you all felt that before? You get nervous and you're like, oh, I can't eat. <laughs> Interestingly, we can find verses in the Bible that support the idea of a mind-gut connection. In Lamentations 1.20, it says, Behold, O Lord, for I am in distress. My bowels are troubled. Mine heart is turned within me, for I have grievously rebelled. And in Jeremiah 4.19, My bowels, my bowels, I am pained at my very heart. Now that we know about the... Um, gut enteric nervous system. I want to teach you a little bit about the gut microbiome or what lives in our gut because this really influences the gut brain access. Um, this is relatively new I'd say within the last decade that scientists are getting a better understanding of it. So there are trillions of bacteria that live in our gut. Did you know that you are more microbe than human? If you count all the cells in your body that 43% are human and the rest make up our microbiome. And there are over 8,000 types of bacteria that live in our gut. And in the picture on the right, you can see how they have a little picture of microbiota that affect the gut to influence what type of neurotransmitters are secreted and affect our stress, our mood, and our behavior. In the Nutrition Review Journal in 2015, in an article entitled Microbiota and the Gut-Brain Axis, 
uh, it's quoted as saying, changes in gut microbiota can modulate the peripheral and central nervous systems, resulting in altered brain functioning and suggesting the existence of a microbiota gut-brain access. Diet can also change the profile of the gut living in you and thereby behavior. This is a big paragraph, but it says a lot of cool stuff. So it says, our health and probably also our behaviors and mood depend not only on what we eat or what we do, but also on what we host. It is well established for decades that all vertebrates, including humans, are colonized by a wide array of bacteria, fungi, parasites, viruses, and that at steady state, this community of microbes establishes a friendly mutual relationship with the host. The diversity and composition of the microbiota are dynamic, depending not only on the host, but also on environmental factors like diet, antibiotic usage, and lifestyle behaviors. These environmental factors may adversely alter the gut ecosystem, and that's called dysbiosis, when things aren't going well. And is frequently associated with increased susceptibility to infections, as well as to non-communicable diseases like obesity, metabolic syndrome, allergy, and other inflammatory diseases. Emerging evidence from, from more recent studies also demonstrate the existence of a bi-directional communication route linking gut and microbiota with brain, thus suggesting that these microbes may play a role in neurological disorders as well as in host perception, behavior, and emotional response. So remember, gut dysbiosis is an adversely altered gut microbiome. And so what are some of the ways that these bacteria can cause problems. So the first one is that depending on what type of bacteria you have living in you, it can increase inflammation. And it does that, you see the blue circle circling some of the words there on your right. Um, it increases cytokines and it affects serotonin and tryptophan and also the way your liver metabolizes things and we'll see that in a minute. Depending on what bacteria are in your gut, it can make your gut leaky and in so doing allow antigens and bacteria to travel places that they shouldn't be causing more disease. I thought this one was fascinating. So gut bacteria can change neurotropins. Neurotropin is a chemical that affects how nerves grow and change and thus it can affect whether or not your brain develops correctly and if it's plastic or not. In other words, if your brain, brain is plastic and you come on a new situation, it'll make new connections and you can remember better. But if it's not plastic, you may have a harder time making new connections and remembering, for example. It also alters drug metabolism in the gut and gene expression in your liver enzymes. So the bacteria that are living in you will affect the way you use a medication, for example, that your doctor gives you. It'll affect the way the drug is metabolized in your body. But one good thing that these bacteria do for us is that they metabolize or they use fiber. Have any of you heard that we can't digest fiber, but it's good for us, right? And what we were told it was like a little broom sweeping things out. Well, it's actually a lot more complicated than that. We don't eat, digest the fiber, but the bacteria do. And the bacteria make something called short chain fatty acids out of the fiber. And this is a small list of the things the short chain fatty acids do. They nourish colon cells. They decrease inflammation. They've been shown to improve ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. They help regulate blood sugar. It reduces the risk of colon cancer. It may help prevent and treat obesity and lower cholesterol levels. And they also decrease the pH of the intestines to prevent the growth of harmful bacteria. So you can see it's super important to eat your foods with fiber. Um, can any of you name some foods that are high in fiber? We went through this last night. Plant foods, okay, so fruit, vegetables, grains, beans, exactly, nuts, those foods have fiber. What about meat? Does meat have fiber? No, no meat, dairy, egg, that doesn't have fiber, just keep that in mind. Okay, so let's take a look at some scientific studies looking specifically at gut bacteria and mood. So they looked at guts, the guts of toddlers, what was living there. 
And it said the microbiome of a toddler's gut may influence their behavior. Scientists found correlations between temperament and the presence of specific types of intestinal bacteria in both girls and boys. So researchers from the Ohio State University studied microbes in children between the ages of 18 and 27. And they found that it behavior in boys particularly depended on the amount and diversity of certain bacterial species that live there. This was even after they adjusted for a history of breastfeeding, their current diet, and the method of childbirth, all of which are also known to influence the type of microbes that live in your gut. And they found that children with the most genetically diverse types of gut bacteria more frequently exhibited positive behaviors like curiosity, being outgoing, and a little more um, willing to take a risk. Children with tantrums had low levels of good bacteria. So next time you're in that restaurant, you see that cranky child, you'll understand what's going on, right? No good bacteria. Um, also, they did studies on the gut microbiome and addiction. So alcohol dependence has traditionally been considered a brain disorder. Um, but alterations in the gut microbiota has recently been shown to be present in psychiatric disorders, which suggests the possibility of gut-brain interactions in the development of alcohol dependence. And just in summation, they took people off of alcohol, and those that experienced the most anxiety and the most symptoms of alcohol withdrawal had the worst gut microbiome. So this opens up a new world for considering how to help treat addiction. Um, for instance, a more plant-based diet might help them with their gut microbiota, which we're going to see here. Uh, because our time is limited, I'd like to show you a list of some of the diseases currently associated with gut dysbiosis, or bad uh, microbiome in your gut. All of the mental disorders are in blue, and the black disorders are those also associated with gut dysbiosis. And you can see anxiety, depression, memory loss, repetitive actions, schizophrenia, Parkinson's, autism, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, MS, cognitive disorders, addictions, and then um, some that are not related to mental disorders. So how does lifestyle affect my gut microbiota? If it's that important, what, what can I do about it? Well. This wouldn't be your fault, but if you were born by C-section, you wouldn't be traveling through the birth canal and you wouldn't get inoculated with the birth canal bacteria. And they did a study of two million babies over 35 years and they found that people that were born by C-section have an increased risk of asthma, connective tissue disorders, arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, immune deficiencies, and leukemia. Um, so that one you can't help, but it's something to keep in mind. Um, then this study notes a connection between diet and gut bacteria. So scientists compared depression and anxiety symptoms in two groups of mice. The first group of mice was fed a high fat diet. The second group of mice was fed a regular diet. The mice on the high fat diet exhibited anxiety, repetitive actions, and a loss of memory. The mice on the regular fat diet did not show increased depression or anxiety. Then they took the gut bacteria from the mice on the high fat diet and they stuck it in the mice on the regular fat diet, but let them keep eating the same. And the mice on a regular fat diet experienced the same symptoms as the mice on the high fat diet, just from getting the bacteria from, from them. Here's another uh, thing that might affect your gut microbiota, and that's antibiotic exposure. So we already know that recurrent antibiotic exposure has, is an in, puts you at an increased risk for depression and, and anxiety. So in this study, they took um, a bunch of patients with depression and those some with anxiety, and they got matched controls. And they treated them with a single antibiotic course and found that it was associated with a higher risk for depression. So why is that? Are the antibiotics specific for your type of bacteria that's causing your infection? They're not. They'll wipe out any or a great majority of bacteria besides the one you're trying to treat. So they found that the risk increased with recurrent antibiotic exposure. 
Okay, what about where you live? Does that make a difference? So researchers evaluated bacteria on countertops of city apartments versus country farm homes. Okay, so they went around and swabbed the countertops and looked to see what would grow. And they found that the city apartment and the country farm home had similar numbers of bacteria. But the country farm home had a greater diversity of bacteria. And if you'll remember in our prior study on the toddlers, the greater the diversity of gut bacteria, the greater the happiness and outgoingness and decreased inflammation they found in those toddlers. And so these findings suggest that those that live in the country might be happier and healthier, especially the children. So in the Journal of Molecular Psychiatry in 2016, in an article entitled From Gut Dysbiosis to Altered Brain Function, it lists a number of lifestyle factors that will affect your gut microbiome brain access. And here's some things that had a positive effect. A low calorie diet was associated with augmented neurogenesis and improved cognition. A plant-based diet uh, was associated with increased brain volume bigger brains, cognitive function, and it prevented the growth of harmful bacteria. Okay, here's the new concept for me, was consumption of prebiotics. We've heard of probiotics. You take some healthy bacteria in a pill. Well, there's prebiotics, that is foods that promote the growth of healthy bacteria, and those foods were whole grains and high fiber foods like fruits and vegetables. And then country living is positively associated with a good gut microbiome brain access. What would negatively affect this? What would make bad bacteria or low diversity um, show up? So the first was the high fat diet. A high fat diet is associated with increased anxiety and decreased synaptic plasticity. In other words, you're not going to be able to make memories as well. A high sugar diet, sucrose is a form of sugar, you had decreased long and short term memory. Meat eating caused a proliferation of harmful bacteria. And um, my husband did a talk last night on cardiovascular disease and when he was looking things up, he found that there was a certain type of bacteria that makes an enzyme that promotes atherosclerosis and it was only found in meat eaters. So I thought that was interesting. Exposure to antibiotics, of course, will change what bacteria are living in your intestines. Even disrupted sleep patterns, alcohol consumption, and smoking. So, this is Abundant Health's signature acronym for the 10 Laws of Health. It's Start a New You. I don't know if you can read it as you read the letters to the left. And for optimal mental health, we've covered kind of quickly, the plant-based and high-fiber diet, how that can be helpful. And we've talked about gut bacteria and the lifestyle factors that will promote healthy uh, gut bacteria. I've also been asked to speak to um, about nature and how that affects you. So in nature, we're going to hit the, some of the other highlights for starting New You, which is sunshine, air, rest, trust in God, exercise, and water. So we'll look through these slides real quick here. Um, we're going to talk about nature mind body therapy. Um, and it's coming to be known as nature therapy or forest bathing. So. <laughs> I liked it. <laughs> oh, and I want to thank my sons. Uh, you'll notice in the corner, uh, either Chad or Chris have donated these pictures for my talk. So. Okay, if you want to improve your short-term memory, a University of Michigan uh, took their students, some of them, and they were given a brief memory test and then divided into two groups. One group took a walk around an arboretum, arboretum, excuse me, and the other half took a walk down a city street. When the participants returned and repeated the test again, those who had walked among trees did almost 20% better than the first time, while those who had taken in city sites instead did not consistently improve. Thought that was pretty interesting. Okay, how many of us would like restored mental energy? I would. So to combat mental fatigue, researchers have found spending time in the great outdoors or even looking at photographs of nature help people's mental energy to bounce back. But this effect was not observed for photos of the city. 
How about stress relief? There were several studies on this. Um, in one study, students were sent into the forest for two nights and they were found to have lower levels of cortisol, which is your stress hormone, than those who spent time in the city. In a second study, office workers with a view of nature out of the window had lower levels of stress and higher job satisfaction. Number three, subjects sent into the forest showed decreases in both heart rate and levels of cortisol when compared with those in the city. I thought this one was pretty amazing. Um, did you know that being in the country can reduce inflammation? So they took 24 elderly patients and divided them into two groups. One group got to go on a seven day, seven night trip into the forest and the other group went on a seven day, seven night trip into the city. Those sent into the forest experienced a decrease in their high blood pressure. Now we need to ask our doctors to write us a script for a seven day, seven night trip into the forest for high blood pressure. Decreased inflammation and increased vigor. Those sent into the city experience little health effects. Improved concentration. It said kids with ADHD have been found to concentrate better after just 20 minutes in the park. Would you like to have sharper thinking and more creativity? So college students were asked to repeat a sequence of numbers back to researchers and they were much more accurate after a walk in nature. In another study, people immersed in nature for four days boosted their performance on a creative problem-solving test by 50%. Okay, if we want to improve our mental health, one study found that walks in the forest were specifically associated with decreased levels of anxiety and bad moods. Another study found that outdoor walks could be useful clinically as a supplement to existing treatments for major depressive disorder. An analysis of 10 studies about green exercise found participants experience improved self-esteem and mood, particularly in the mentally ill. The presence of water made the positive effects even stronger. So why is this connection between green space and health? Well, researchers point to recovery from stress and attention fatigue, encouragement of physical activity, facilitation of social contact, and better air quality, as well as nature's positive effect on mental health, which boosts overall health and long longevity as well. This was interesting. If you get into the hospital, be sure to ask for a room with a view, because patients with a view of trees outside their hospital window needed one-fourth the pain meds um, after a surgery and got out of the hospital one day earlier than those with a view of a brick wall. <laughs> um, in this study, they used MRI brain scans and looked at and compared sounds, sounds of nature with sounds that were man-made. And they recruited 17 healthy adults to receive functional MRI scans while listening to a series of five-minute soundscapes of natural and man-made environments. Specifically, listening to artificial sounds was associated with a pattern of inward focused attention. And that would be things like worrying or, uh, and it's been linked with things like post-traumatic stress disorder or anxiety. But on the other hand, if you listen to nature sounds, it helped the participants to have a more external focus on others, not on their self. And it ended up helping with their anxiety and depression. What about photos and brain activation? So test subjects were shown photos of either the city or nature. Photos of cities increased blood flow to the amygdala. The amygdala is our impulse center in our brain. It's the one that tells us, oh, you do it, do it, do it, but it might not be the right thing. Photos of nature, however, increase blood flow to the anterior cingulate gyrus, which is involved more in making decisions, uh, good decisions. So some of the benefits nature has for the mind that we've covered are improved short-term memory, restored mental energy, stress relief, fewer pain meds post-operatively, Reduced inflammation, improved concentration, sharper thinking and creativity, improved mental health, reduced risk of early death, and shorter hospital stays. 
and all of you by coming here today it has put you in the biggest room in the world and that is the room for improvement. So I hope that some of the things I've said uh, you'll be able to take home and use and improve the way that you feel. Um, and also we'd like to uh, use Abundant Health's motto and start putting knowledge into action. We'd like to invite you to join us now for a plant-based meal to feed our gut microbiota and also for a walk to improve our mood as we go out into nature. Uh, while they're getting the food ready, I'm going to play a short nature video, but feel to, free to get up, go to the bathroom, or whatever you need to do. And thank you all very much for coming. Thank you.